Lineouts. Racks. Tries and tackles dissected by South Africa's top rugby minds. This is To The Last Drop, your weekly in-depth rugby podcast with Liam Delcom and Brendan Nell. Welcome back, guys. This is To The Last Drop. I'm Brendan Nell. And I'm Liam Delcom. And uh, we on the back of a great win for the Springboks in Brisbane. Exceptional win, 33-7. Could have been a lot more. Probably they have 30 points on, on the field there. Jeez, Brendan, that's, that's almost ambitious, but okay, go on then. Well, well, I think we could probably go through it, probably count around 30 points. Uh, but that's... yeah, I mean, if, if you look at it, how great is it just to see the team win overseas and play with such confidence? I think there's two elements to it. I think it's the way Springbok rugby finds itself at the moment. Uh, there is a lot of depth. There's a lot of confidence and obviously a lot of belief. And uh, when you explain that, then you have to understand that it, uh, the head coach has been around for the last six years. So, you know, it's, it's kind of the plan coming together. I won't say slowly because they won the World Cup earlier than the, than they thought in 2019, but it certainly helped in the progress of the team. It, it, it certainly gave them more confidence. It gave them more belief. And, of course, that, that squad has grown so much over the last couple of years. And if you juxtapose that to why Australian rugby finds itself a lot of uncertainty. They've gone through a number of coaches. They've got an exceptional coach now in Joe Schmidt. But it also reminds us that these things take time. You just don't develop a team uh, within the space of a couple of tests and, and hope that they perform miracles. There's a cynic in me that says this is, might be, and there's an argument that maybe the consequences of calling for South Africa to leave Super Rugby for so many years for Australia and when you look at the scoreline 33-7, Australia at the moment ninth in the world. They sandwich between Italy and Fiji. And if you ever say Springboks beat Fiji or Italy by 33-7, probably say, yeah, that's about right. So it was pretty much that. Although I think, as I said, I think the box left a number of points on the field, but mm. they're not quite the, the finished item yet. And, and I think there was a good number of great uh, performances. But of course, that's all been overtaken by a very different, Team change uh, Springbok selection. It has. And, and just to get back to your point of uh, they probably not where they want to be. If, if you're going to make wholesale changes and you're going to do that often enough, obviously that's going to disrupt your, your rhythm and your flow and continuity and so on. That is a, a byproduct of making those changes. There is, of course, the longer term objective that you're trying to meet. So they're quite happy to you know suffer short term losses. I don't mean losses that initially means defeat. But, you know, here and there, there's going to be a little dip in performance because players haven't necessarily played together an awful lot. I think overall, though, what Springbok Rugby has done well over the last few years is that they've kept their eye on the ball in terms of what they're trying to achieve. There is the bigger picture. World Cup is very much our focus. There are other nations that have a different strategy, but it's one that we have held on to. And it's one that I, I suspect our South African fans are very happy with. Yeah, and I think the one thing that, that sort of stands out to me is that you know, the box have always been a team for the big occasion. They've always turned up for World Cups. Well, mostly. Yep. We discount maybe 2003. And, yeah, but they've always been the team and the team that's sort of turned up for those big matches. They haven't been the team between World Cups that's dominated. But that's always been the tag the All Blacks have had. And for the first time, probably since I've been writing rugby them, and you've done it a little bit longer than me, you almost have this optimism that they could become that side that could dominate between World Cups. And and this selection now for the second test in Perth, you know, you're starting to get towards that point where the box can play two separate teams. And I know there, there'll be those outside that say, yes, they did before the 2019 and 2023 World Cups against Australia, for instance. But there's certainly getting to that point that they can do this rather consistently, have two teams that they can put on the park on any week mm. against any opposition. And, and maybe, Michael, we, I suppose we have to wait until after this weekend's result to say that, but there certainly is that sense that they're getting closer and closer to that goal. Yeah, even if they suffer a setback this weekend, I think if they go on and win the rugby championship, uh, that becomes a very valid point because then they could jolly well go on and, and dominate between World Cups as well. Because you're putting those miles into the players, the inexperienced players, you're giving the experience against a Tier 1 nation. I know you said that the Wallabies are ranked ninth in the world, but it's still the rugby championship, so it's still a challenge. 
Um, but the important thing is that they, if they win this year's rugby championship, it certainly sets them up for potential domination between World Cups, which hasn't necessarily been the Springboks' focus uh, since Rassi Rasmus took over the reins. A little earlier, Brendan, you mentioned 2003. I'm glad you did because that sets us up quite nicely for uh, our long interview this week. We've got it. An interview with uh, a man who made his test debut in 2003, a man of many talents, a man of strong opinions. He's one of the sort of free thinkers um, when it comes to rugby punditry. And he's in a way a, like a colleague of yours, isn't he? He is. We both work for the Pay Channel as well, and we both bump into each other there. Uh, yeah, so with no further ado, here's our long interview with one of our dearest and oldest friends. This week, we have a special guest who, in many ways, does not need any introduction. A man that has played Test Rugby. He's played for a number of provinces. He's played in different positions. He's gone in the back line. He's gone forwards. A man of many talents, a coach, a TV pundit, a podcaster. Um, Kobari Bomo, am I leaving anything out? Uh, a rapper. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> obvious one. That's the obvious one I left out. I thought Kennedy Tepper was here. He's the rapper, isn't he? You know, Mas, well, Kennedy and I started to do our own little song. We're trying to release a song when it was still playing for the cats, but that never saw the day or light. Mm. Just terrible, terrible. Bobs, welcome, man. Welcome. And uh, yeah, thanks for being on our podcast. We've wanted you on here for a while. Uh, and then a good week because there's lots to talk about about the spring box. Where do we start? Let's start. 10 challenges. Uh, just your thoughts. I'm actually one person who's mightily excited about this. I think the Springboks are doing the right thing. You know, coaches talk about momentum and how do you deal with momentum? How do you deal with momentum is that you create competition. What you want to do is want to put players in uncomfortable position where you can test them. And hopefully now you can get the best out of them because everyone is in good spirits. Even the players who started last week sort of understand the process because it's much easier. Well, so it'll be different if you had lost because now we'll look at these changes that those players were dropped. That's a different mindset in the whole squad because now the whole squad is buying into it, knowing that everyone is getting a chance and you're creating competition. And those players get to work on the other detail of making sure that they can prep a team. And it tests a lot of characters around the squad. I think the Springboks are in a good space in the way that they want to create a high-performance environment where people are being challenged consistent. It's funny you should mention that because Marco van Staden was asked a question in the build-up to the test uh, about the changes and how that may potentially impact performance. You know, what is the motivation of the guys coming in? Uh, because obviously they're not necessarily seen as the players who would play uh, against the All Blacks or in a World Cup final. And he made the point that there is no motivation needed. This is an opportunity for them. And it's a chance that they are willing to grab with both hands. And it's only time, right? You want to test yourself against a tier one nation away from hope. But we mustn't forget Australia is where we're going to play the next World Cup. So what a best of experience for the coaches and the players themselves to know what they can expect from the conditions, from the, the crowds, the, what is the travel, the logistics of what happens in that country. And important for them is to get a performance and a result because that's what's going to garner as you get to tougher times and as the squads are getting close to be picked for the World Cup. I want to jump in here and say, just first of all, just how wonderful it is to be speaking about Springbok rugby like this. I know we probably, we don't realize we're in the best of times at the moment. But I was just thinking as you were talking that how different it was to when you became a Bok and went to Australia for a certain World Cup, talking about 2003. I mean, that famous story about Graham getting into a, getting your World Cup caught up and then blindfolded and shoved into a bus. And I'm still drought and all that sort of stuff. So nice to be talking about rugby rather than other things. Exactly. Like w when I take you back to what is it now, 21 years ago, when um, we're sitting in the, in the dugout in the hall, trying to spoon each other to warmth in the cold of Victoria in the farm and consistently being asked and judged upon what was a Springbok side that was suffering big losses. That is, is after 30 points against England and Twickenham. This is when the Springbok side, I think it was the first time we lost ever to Scotland the year before. And we almost felt like we were the cursed ones. 
Because, I mean, this is from 1995 winning the Rugby World Cup. 99, getting to the semifinal, becoming third. 2003 is a disaster. And you were making your day, which was not the most kindest way of being introduced to international rugby. This is what I enjoy about this framework team is that we sit around and we talk about the opportunities and the options and how the squad uh, grows. And we're not talking about the stuff that South Africans talk about, color, politics, and how do we balance this? And all of a sudden, we're looking at ourselves as innovators, people who are pushing the game further. We are the ones who are leading on the leading front. I, I look at it and I'm thinking, being a young player who is potentially an uh, international star, to be in this environment is probably the best place you can be at this time. And for me, I'm very aware of the fact this is the, probably the most special group that we're ever going to see in the Springbok Green and Gold. You brought up that uh, 2002 tour. I was on that tour and it was one bus accident after the other. So starting 2003, there was certainly a lot that had to be done to get the box ready for the 2003 World Cup. And to be fair, I mean, there was a decent start. I mean, when you made your debut in 2003, it was mid-year. Uh, there was a game against Scotland. There was Argentina. And then there was a, a trip to Carisbrook, which uh, back in the day was one of the most daunting prospects for any touring team to New Zealand. Uh, and the box actually stepped away from that game. They lost, but it wasn't by a great margin. And actually, I think in many ways, would have walked away from that game feeling if we run them this close here, if we meet them late in the year, we may have a chance. But if, then, of course, for you personally, um, bad luck came into play. Yeah, I look at it back in, in that 2003 and that opportunity I've got. So can you imagine my frustration? I'm sitting, it's Nelson Mandela's birthday. I'm sitting at Loftus on the bench against the All Blacks and we're getting 50 points. For a moment and there, I thought you were going to say you slipped on a piece of cake. <laughs> no, we're getting 50 points and no one wants to slip on a cake and put me on the field. Just to like, let's make a mistake and bring bombs on. Maybe this will help just to change the things. But the one thing that sort of after that 50, I remember one of the fans was asking my dad because my dad was there wearing my jersey. He's like, hey, how bad were we? And my dad sort of stood up and he turned around. He's like, if they put him on, would have done better. Meaning that if they put me on to the field, so by the time I got to Dunedin, I was hella motivated. I didn't just want to do it for myself. I wanted to do it for the other younger players who were coming behind me who had not been given that chance. And I thought to myself, what a better time to play rugby against the All Blacks in New Zealand when the whole of Dunedin went black for that whole week. And it could be a daunting task for a young man, but I was looking at it like how much respect they're showing the Springboks. The fact that they have to make sure that they put that presence around you. So I knew what was the, the importance of the performance. And just going to that game, I was listening to my music and I was thinking to myself, that tunnel manga doesn't get what you see, see today. But it, it was a great competition. Aaron Major, uh, the Joel Rococos of those days. The only thing we can remember about that test was the try of the best pop try ever when Richie Bands literally ran through the whole of the All Blacks and Carlos Spencer still has him over his shoulder. <laughs> I'm glad your memory is that good because uh, I was going to fast forward slightly. Later that year, you did go to the World Cup, but not as a player. You can describe the, you know, the capacity the, in which the position. you went with, with a certain Jean de Villiers. But, so I don't know, if, did, did you stay for the duration of the World Cup? But they were there for a fair length of time. And the only reason I'm bringing this up, you yeah. spent quite a bit of time in Perth. So maybe yes. you can give our listeners a, a sense of what it's like to spend uh, time in Perth when you're not necessarily playing. I'm talking now of going into, what is it, Northbridge, going to the Subiaco Hotel, Bocktown, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we didn't make it to the World Cup because we both got injured, Jean Tavellas and I. And the one thing that they said we must do was to host the fans at the Bocktown. So the Bocktown is popping up all over. And that was pretty much what we are good at, is to make sure that everyone else gets to know the world coming up. How does it feel to be there with the Springbok players who are really ready to have fun and make sure that you enjoy yourself so that you don't remember the next day the things that we said to you about you, to yourself. Because after a few Kool-Aids and just the way of how we socialize as South Africans, I mean, the brand of rain and Coke was going well in Pepontate which is the new word now that's been coined because it feels like Blue Pantani, but 
um, it it was it was an uh, for us. I think the experience of knowing how the SAC and fans sort of were so proud of the team, and even though the build up was terrible because we made it to the headlines for the wrong reason, the chicken and egg situation. And I know everyone else will be thinking, was it the chicken? Was it the egg? No, we were given a chicken and an egg to cook overnight whilst we were in the camp. And that's what the boys got before they played against England as part of motivation of understanding the adversity that they've been through. And they could use that as part of inspiration. I mean, those are the days where, I guess, psychology and mental wellness was not something that was thought about. It was more of get up and just do the job. I mean, you didn't need to have so much complex game plan. So it was very fun. I really enjoyed myself. I think I met so many people, which are still today. They'll tell me how much they still do remember of what we went through. Me and Sean de Villiers, I thought we were great hosts. So we made sure that we stayed up the whole night so that everyone could find their ways back home. And yeah, we were very supportive of the Africans who were there. And I think Perth, this time around, I mean, we saw Brisbane. Brisbane was about 20 odd thousand South Africans in there. I think this weekend is when we're coming into a Bloomberg State test match or a Loftus test. I was going to love, I saw a comment on, on one of the social media channels this week saying that uh, South African fans are at a different level. They don't come, come across like the Lions fans in, in hordes in a play. They simply move to the country, establish themselves there, and eat them out from within sort of thing. And I thought, yeah, that sounds like, but, but Perth, yeah, Perth is going to be a huge bock. And it's, it's amazing to see so many bock fans out there. I mean, just, I think we all were a bit surprised, but I mean, I, we've all encountered various shades of the popper bikes around when we go overseas, but uh, there's obviously a lot of South Africans over there and it's going to be great for the box. But just maybe, 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 them, uh, maybe we should talk, let's, let's talk a little bit about the test first of all, because I'll be going, we go oh, yes, of course. Right? And I'm, I'm a bit worried where we can go down memory lane because there's a couple of alleyways that end up in, uh, Yeah, memory lane is quite wide with, uh, with books. <laughs> We could have quite an interesting podcast that has nothing to do with rugby. But uh, first of all, just just on this weekend's game, and uh, what you said right at the beginning about this this young team, one of the things I think that people are also missing maybe is is and it hasn't been picked up that much is if you look at the the, the squad selection this week, you've got Salman Murat the the team, you've got Ruan Nokia as a franchise captain, you've got Sasha who's who's also was a captain at school and also a leader. And there's a bunch of other guys there who were leaders in, in their various schools. John Krobala is one of them. A bunch of the youngsters that are coming through. One of the things I think what people haven't picked up that Russ is also trying to do, which I believe he's trying to do at least, is, is that we are, Sia has been very successful as a captain because of the leadership group around the, the Peter Step, the Toy, Yabin, the Kanyo. There's a bunch of those guys around him, Andre, who've already given him the support he needs in those tough times on the field. It almost looks like Russ's in this is also trying to establish a new leadership group. Because the one thing we, I suppose we should remember is that of all that leadership, they all on the wrong side of 30 by the next World Cup. So you're going to need to replace them at some point. And I know there's some people who, who question Solomon Murat in his play. He's not the most flashiest player, but he's certainly somebody who's been designated as a leader from his school days. And do you see the same thing sort of happening that they're building a new leadership group in that young, young group? I mean, for, for my side, what I saw in Bloemfontein with someone was the first time captain in the Springboks. The influence that Lucania Arm had as the leader on the field. For me, what was quite good, because you have the dead time in a game when the ball gets kicked out, there's, a, there's an injury. This is the time that you use to sort of refocus and to get the messages across. And the one person who was leading that conversation was Lucania Arm. And we know that Lukanya Arm has been part of that leadership group. Uh, he was privy to what were the plans for the season from the start as one of those leaders, although he was injured. So he is so far ahead of knowing what is the plans of what they're trying to go and what it means to be at that level and how to play. And it showed in the way that he played. It showed in the way that he took the pressure off Solomon. Because now all of a sudden, what do you have, like you mentioned, you've got a strong leadership group. Uh, I was pretty impressed about how Peter Steph Detroit did last week, not just as a part calling the lineups, but as a leader in how he managed everyone around him and got everyone going. Same performance 
different way of how he was an influence on the field. He could see and feel his presence of how everyone was sort of looking to him, towards him for direction and, and a bit of help. So that is, that is a very brilliant way of, of trying to create your leadership group. It's even to the levels of, I was speaking to Shimmy talking about how vocal Sasha is at the training, the way that you were commanding senior players of 95 days camps like Billy LaRue so that they can stick to detail. If you have a, a, a place where younger players feel that they do have a voice and they do have a space where they can add to this environment, I think that's how you grow a leadership group by giving those youngsters and put them under pressure in a test situation. And, and that's going to be what's going to be happening this weekend. And I, I'm, I'm so happy for the, I guess, the bravery and the courage that the squad has to, to say, you know what, we'll sit back. This is a spring of squad. It doesn't matter who we're putting up. Everyone that's on that field is backed by everyone who's off that group. Do you also get the sense that it's almost as if they try and steer the conversation away of a succession plan when you have to come up with a name, the person who's going to lead the Springboks after uh, Sia Khaleesi, that they have so many options or have developed uh, this narrative almost of that they have so many options that you can't really pinpoint a single individual. I, I suppose with Salman, uh, age is very much on his side if you're thinking of long-term captaincy. But it's also one of those things where the moment somebody has an armband or is vice captain, they kind of steer the conversation away from that. Yeah, it, it's, um, I mean, it's one of those things I think uh, Rusty has been uh, the difference as a coach because he's been a player at that level. He understands what those sort of positions come with. Uh, attention from the media. You mustn't forget, Rusty Rasmus is the same player who denied Springbok captaincy. When he said that, no, he was not ready. He didn't feel that it was him who was supposed to lead the spring box. So he knows exactly the pressures that this, this come with. I mean, you have to build a leadership group, what type of player that you need to lead the national side and what type of uh, characters you need around that player. So for, for me, it just shows someone who has been very introspective in the way that he's coached the spring national team by using himself as an example of how do I not create the environment I wish I had when I was a Springbok. And that's what I'm starting to feel with Rusty is he's very protective of that group that he has and he doesn't want to isolate anyone so that they could be attacked in virtual commas, attacked or in any way be subjugated to anything that will make them feel uncomfortable within the, the space. I think they've been quite upfront about what they trying to do without really stamping in and say, this is our next guard. This is how we're going to say, this is our new leader. I think it's important too for the players to keep their words about themselves because once all of a sudden, oh, I've arrived, look at me, I'm the guy, I will be captain in the Springboks in 2027. And then that could actually sort of uh, go against what this team is about with people with no entitlement, no DICKs. So that is what I'm looking at. Yeah, I can only think, I mean, at the moment, you know, you look at some of the players coming in, I don't think we'd bet on the island with, most of them, maybe. I, I think the only one I bet a bit about it is is young Hendrik Vessels because um, it hasn't really been settled that Bulls what he is. If he's a hooker or a prop, Jake seems to think he's a hooker. Where Rossi seems to think he's a prop, and I think they need to settle that at some point for his future as well. But I think Rossi's settling that very quickly as well. He seems to have really made up his mind about Jan Hendrik. The the way that he's been very bullish about the fact that. He is the next Osteran similar player to a Malcolm Marx. And I mean, he has to test it now. I thought God, Stienkamp, Stienkamp was, was brilliant when he came on. Um, he hasn't missed a beat ever since, I guess, that semi final against Leinster when he really showed what he's up against when he scrummed against Fellow. So for, for me, it's very brave for Rossi, but this guy, which is quite nice in South Africa nowadays, is that we have a system where the young players have been identified from before, which means that they've been privy to the conversations with the coaches. They're not being thrown in the deep end in such a way. Yes, the game will be the deep end, but you yourself has been prepared in terms of what are you getting? Who is looking after your preparation? How's done human? What is he finding out of the way that you prep for the games? And then you look around you, you have Oxen Chair, you have 
all of these senior players in the front row. And you'd almost got that cult figure thing of the tight fight of the Springboks, always trying to make sure that they are competing at training. I think for me, it is in a way, in, in, in this position of, I could say, and lucky that in Australia, they're not like, you're not going to scrum the world down. You will have a, you will have a taste because you will have scrum against an experienced slipper or a, one of those ala ala towers. But it's actually not a bad case to actually grind your teeth and make sure that you as a youngster, you can take some lessons from this and hopefully you can get parity. If it goes your way, dominance will be ideal. Yeah, I was going to say... I want to bring it to the field... Uh, Sorry, sorry. Be, I was going to say, the one thing about that as well is if you look at that bench with Vincent Ox and Malcolm on the bench, this isn't something new that even if things do go badly on Saturday, they have appeared in the second half with been a lost cause and turned the game around. And I think even if the box are six or seven points behind with 20 minutes to go and they appear on the field, I think that the, the psych- psychological advantage they bring with what they bring onto that field at that time, you'd back the box to win anyway. So I think there's enough cover there, and props you can bring back if you need to. So, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I'm really looking forward to that, and I hope you, but it's an interesting question. Where does he go back to onto the box? Does he go back to Uka? or Because the balls have got a decent number. Carol Stenner comes there. He's a pretty decent producer. And Jan Probler is the number three box. So do you, where do you put it when he goes back? It's one of those things, and understanding your roles. Wherever you get called upon, First of all, you're privileged to be a professional rugby player in South Africa. And for you to be precious about where they put you or where you play, uh, it could work against you. Because in that way, there's so many players who are at the same level as you are. Once you get entitled and you feel like, no, I do have this place. I can sort of channel myself. I need. No, you don't become precious. What you want to do is that you want to be given, you want to get into a place and an environment where you can showcase what is your capability. It what identifies you and what differentiates you as a player is who you are as a player. Yes, there are those structures, but you as a player, as an individual, if you don't get into an environment and add, you'll be the first one to leave. I want to drag you into the midfield quickly. Interesting selection there. Lucanio Am, partnering Jesse Creel. Oh, you seem quite enthused by this idea. Why are you so enthused by this idea? I've always thought Lucanio is an inside center. I, I know lots of people, we've seen him do so well at outside center. Let's look at what the roles of an inside center and an outside center do. Outside centers are line breakers. They're the players who go for the outside gaps. Lucanio is not the type of player. He's put more people into those outside gaps than he has right through those holes. Although he will do because he has that gravy acumen and IQ to play it like that. But for me, Lukanyo with ball in hand is much more of a threat as an organizer. He's much more of a threat as how he reads the defense right in front of him, where he can find space in front of him, can find space at the back. Surprising me, the way that everyone, it went over the heads, the way that he played uh, against Portugal, first of all, because of the opposition. But no one saw that he kicked with his left foot and his right foot for clearances. No one saw that he was running the meetings. No one saw that he created an opportunity for Makazola Mapimpi's try where there was six versus seven at inside center. And that's a type of player when it comes to transitional play, the calmness and the high he reads his 10, giving them the time and space when he knows when they're going to strike so that he can complement them with a different line. There's a line break that Mani Lebok did. Lukanya just let him run in front of him. And then it was up to him seeing that the player, the only option that he had was a switch. But he almost forced him to that decision by the line that he ran, which is a much easier pass for money to buff. And that's the IQ that I'm talking about when it comes to Lukanyu and playing on the inside. And how he helped defensively, because the wingers had to tackle in and become outside centers that day. He was the one who was marshalling that defensive effort, making sure that these players could keep their cool. Not too many wingers are the bravest guys when it comes to natural deep. And Lukanyu made that look seamless. And you talked about Makazoli there. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, and I, I know you've been all serious with the Kanye here, but do you think, uh, do you, I, I think Makazoli being, if, if there's going to be one player, and every player is motivated playing for Springbok, if there's one player with that extra, extra dollop of, of motivation, the finest Marika Corey event there again, after what happened in 22 in Adelaide and in Sydney the week later, 
I don't think there's many, Marcus Willis is a very quiet, laid back guy. There's not many players that get his goat up, but he certainly had his goat up that those two tests. Now, I'm happy that he's created that sort of flavor and needs a nemesis kind of vibe. And, and he's really found one in the Korean Betty. And I just want to hear him. I hope this weekend we can have the, the special effects mics up again so he can say, hey, you shut up. Shut up, you. That's what I want to hear. Because you know what's nice about Marcus Wadi? I was sitting back and, and thinking about how special his whole journey has been. He's a man who hasn't missed a beat every time they've called upon him. He had the late blooming sort of call from Jolomna in East London. But what he does, he just does his job. He's there to score twice. That's what he will do. He's there to take a, take a high ball. He's there to clean. He'll go and steal the ball. He leaves nothing unturned when it comes to how he plays the game. And there's no frills and there's nothing that, that sort of screams out at you and say, no, this guy is, he is not too sure about what he's doing. He's been consistently a high performance and, and consistently giving you 70s and higher. Uh, maybe when he scores lots of tries, like a head trick, you will see Makazola. But the only thing I wish he could do is go to a finishing school for his diving because, gee, mm. this, I think he's going to hurt his knees one day. Yeah, that's about the only thing we can say about his, his finishing. <laughs> that's it. I mean, look at that. <laughs> I mean, what's it, 30 tries in 43 tests? And it's not that he slowed down either on that score because in his last six, he went six tests where he didn't score a try. And then in his four, next six, he has scored eight. So the touch is still there. No, he is, he is an amazing. I think he's a true professional. A uh, lot of these young players could look at him and, and how he sort of preps. He's never out of shape. I mean, the guy is just solid as a rock. Every time he gets a chance, even if he's playing for the franchise, that's what I like about Marcus Zoli. The intensity stays the same. Mm. He's consistently trying to prove to himself that promise he made himself that he's got talent. He's going to show it every weekend. And tonight it's a special time. I think, I don't think he's actually as celebrated as he's supposed to be because we've got the Power Rangers, the scrum cap. Maybe he needs a scrum cap. Who knows? Mm. Bob's last one from me is just, just on, you spoke about John and you spoke about talking to Chevy. The one thing that you don't have in common with them is that you don't have six or seven TV shows or podcast shows or YouTube shows. <laughs> uh, why not? And, and is it because Super Sport keeps you so busy? Wow. <laughs> no, the what a cue no, 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 no. The first thing is that I love my job. <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the third thing is that I'm in Johannesburg. The only people I can hang with is you guys. So, I mean, why don't you guys put me more into these kind of situations so I could be like a Cape Tony. I'm, I'm so happy for the gents because, you know, what's nice now is that us as South African of the, of the game, we, we're becoming much more brave. We are speaking our minds. We've always felt like as if we were being invited into conversations. Always felt like we have to be these. Yes, thank you, please. Yeah, no, we're sorry to be here. South African type of uh, comms or whatever we're doing. And all of a sudden, now we have the voices because our team is doing well, first of all. And we do have knowledgeable people when it comes to rugby. Yeah, so for me, I'm, I'm just happy for them to be putting their voices out there because what it does, it opens more doors for us. As much as To The Last Drop is a, is a, a podcast that celebrates rugby, uh, we also celebrate what we put in our glasses or in our mugs uh, for yeah. those uh, who like that. If we were to catch you where you are, you've got some downtime, you're watching a game in your own spare time, uh, what are we likely to find in your glass? Other than Bundaberg my, when you're in Aussie. In, in my class these days, I think you'll probably find, which is I'm still looking for, is a Guinness 0.0. .0. Um, what? All, what is the point? Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, well, it's a placebo effect, right? I don't feel left out when I'm hanging around <laughs> because I stopped drinking. At least no one's going to ask me things like, do you have a problem? Why have you stopped drinking? I say, here, it's zero. <laughs> now, nah, it's, uh, it's one of those things. Uh, I just know that once I allow the other spirit to meet me, and then when I meet the <laughs> other bobs, who are, I, I deem them to be called uh, Kieran, the black Irish guy, you don't want to meet that guy. I've kept that guy down in the, in, in the cupboard for a bit. So I, um, one day I'll see him again. We'll so it's Stout meets Guinness. 
<laughs> they're stoked. <laughs> we'll have to get Carol on the podcast. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Bob, so thank, thank you for coming on. I think we, we're running out of time, but we're going to say thank you. And no. Listen, there's an open invitation. Come back whenever you want. We can do these for hours, as you know. I mean, I, I, I know. And thank you so much. And I'll take you up on that. And whenever I can give a bit of help or wherever you feel that I can add value, James, you know my numbers. You got my email now. So yeah, let's go. I, th- I think this is also my cue for uh, promising to make a light a big fire and we can all do it together. Yes. yes. And we need to get to that bit. Yes. When is our chef going to give us some? <laughs> pressure, Leo. Pressure. No, I'm happy to light a fire. Don't worry. Good times. I'll hold you to it. Well, thanks very much. Have a good one. Cool. Thanks, man. Okay, that was fun. All those things being said, now it's time to nail our colors to the mast. It's a much changed team, obviously, as we discussed. Uh, will it break rhythm? Will it break continuity? I think in some ways it will, but I think there's still enough class in that Springbok team to see off the Wallabies this week. I think the Wallabies will be better. I mean, they were pretty flat last week, so they will be better. So maybe not as commanding a scoreline. I'll still say the box by 13. And then I'll give you a, a little sting in the tail after you've made your prediction. Yeah, I think I think pretty much you're probably going to see a very different game than last week. They probably struggle for a bit of rhythm in the start. And even if things do go wrong, which I, I don't think they will necessarily, they have enough firepower on that bench, especially with that front row come around and changes the whole momentum of the game. Uh, I'd also go for a Bok win. I would probably go a bit less by about eight or nine. And only because there's a bunch of youngsters and the spine in the Bok team is a very young one all around. But it'll take them a little while to settle. So box by eight or nine. And I think the my quirky call for the for the game would be for if there's anybody who's going to make a very big impression, it's going to be Johan Krobler, who's going to make the most jackals. Okay, that's an interesting one. Yeah. I'm going to go with, and in some ways it's an obvious one, I'm going to go with Makazola Mapimpi to score his ninth try in his last seven tests, including obviously this weekend will be, yes, so it'll be nine tries in seven tests. And he will do so early. I think he'll do so in the first six minutes. He'll be the first man to score a try on Saturday. I'm going to come back in there and say, by smoking Marika Koryabete, we don't know if he's been chosen yet because we're recording this before the Aussie team's been chosen. But by smoking him in the corner on the outside. Interesting choice of word there. Well, anyway, it's been a fun episode. We've got a lot to look forward to this weekend. Thank you for listening to us. We'll be back next week with more guests and more more talk about the Springboks and hopefully another Springbok victory. Thanks for listening. For the latest insights and rugby analysis each week, plus new episode alerts, please follow or subscribe to the series. Or find all episodes at jacarandafm.com or the Jackpot app. That is world class.